basically I give instruction in a way that my students can teach me the same material. And that's how I know that they get a grip on it. But the, um, the, I guess also at the core of my teaching where I think I might've deferred from our professor, uh, I like to think that you're playing is a combination of different teachings and different lessons and different theories that you come across. So for my students, I like to give them more of an explorative nature on the instrument. Warning. This episode contains adult language and adult humor. Since when have trumpet players ever been considered adults? If you are easily offended by these types of conversations, consider switching to the oboe. Welcome to the Trumpet Gurus Hang podcast. I'm your host, Jose Johnson. My guest for this episode is Melvin Jones. Melvin is an inspirational man. As the trumpet professor at the historic Morehouse College in Atlanta, Melvin is dedicated to using his keen analytical mind and practical world experience to not only help his students become better trumpet players, but also to fulfill the Morehouse motto and live a life of distinction. Plus, dude can flat out play. So, pour yourself a big glass, pull up a chair, and let the hang begin. All right, welcome to this episode, and I am joined by Melvin Jones. Melvin, this is uh, this is going to be fun, man. You know, we we've never met, so this is this is our hang uh, yeah. to know each other, so everybody gets to gets to know you as well. So, uh, you know, I, I did a little bit of research. I try not to research too heavy because you know I want this to be real. Yeah. Um, and you know, you you've just you've done so many things, uh, particularly in the world. I mean, yeah, obviously as a performer, but also in the world of education. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, your connection uh, over the years with uh, with Morehouse has definitely, mm-hmm. uh, you know, for people who aren't hip to to what Morehouse is and what the history of Morehouse. Um, let's talk a little bit about that because I, I think that uh, you know, especially people aren't aren't you know aren't privy to that culture. Yeah, um, yeah there, there's so much history uh, in that university and, and as it relates to music. So, uh, yeah. yeah, so so tell me a little bit about that, man. All right. So uh, Morehouse is an institution set up for educating uh, black males um, exclusively. Uh, the only institution of its kind to educate black men and um, uh, black African-Americans. I have to be kind of specific with that. And um, it's such a unique experience because the tradition is a part of the education in a way that I can't describe anywhere else. And having gone from um, gone from here to go on to, to do my graduate studies at Rutgers, I can say as a student here, um, at any HBCU, you get kind of a culture shock if you're not used to being around a lot of other, you know, Black people. But then when you deal with the other dynamics of this being, I, I wouldn't say like the creme de la creme, but if you come from a high school where you're accustomed to being the top of your class, you find yourself surrounded by other black people who are also tops of their individual classes. So it really puts the rest of the world into a different kind of view. And I'll say the, the culture shock I personally received my freshman year was seeing the type of variety that exists when you say black man. I think a lot of times you get, um, you, you know, you get kind of a monolithic or just kind of the way things are portrayed from a media standpoint or just what you grow up with. You, you get kind of a tunnel, you know, a tunnel view of what this means. Right. Morehouse opens you up to, you know, the, the world of black and HBCUs in general do that. But here at Morehouse, it's, a, it's an even more unique situation because we're in what's called the Atlanta University Consortium. So at, at AUC for short. This is a, when I was a student, there was a collection of five different schools here. There was Morehouse College, all-male institution, Spelman College, an all-female institution, Clark Atlanta University, co-ed institution, Morris Brown, also a co-ed institution, and then the interdenominational, um, you know, the the ITC, essentially. So there were, um, uh, it was such a, a, a melting pot. Of different versions of, of just just black across the spectrum, so that particular experience was eye opening for me. Morehouse has the particular task of taking young boys and turning them into men, and 
that involved a lot of different um, a lot of different versions of education. Of course, there's the classical education you see receive in class. But there's also societal. There's also a different historical perspective. There's a different political perspective. All of that goes into education here. And so it really creates a, a unique place. And when you think of the, the, I guess, the luminaries or some of the alumni that have come out of here, getting the network with Spike Lee and Samuel Jackson when I was a student, getting to meet them. And then I, I returned later as band director, getting to speak to them on different occasions, as well as, uh, you know, Satchel Page. And, you know, I mean, the, 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 the names of people that have either come through here or been associated with the school, it's insane just to say yeah. the least. And, you know, I, I think this creates an environment that would benefit anyone coming from any neighborhood who just wants to know that there's more that's possible because this, this place kind of reminds you that the sky can still be the limit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and, and that's, that's really interesting to me because, um, you know, when, when, when people aren't aware of that deep history and not just the, in terms of, you know, the fact that the, that the, the university itself is as old as it is, but right. the, the history in terms of what it has done and what it, it has helped to do. Um, and it's, it's that common, it's that bringing together, um, you know, the richness of, you know, of, of the black culture, the, you know, the, or, or, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm half black. My father's black. Uh, mm -hmm. My mother's Mexican. So, um, you know, it, it's the richness of the culture. Yeah. Um, it's understanding that particularly at the time of the formation of that university and, and the other universities, um, you know, we weren't afforded the same rights and privileges as, as other people. And, right. You know, to to not only just take it on, you know, to, for a community to take it on itself to say, okay, well, we're going to provide what others are trying to deny us, but to do it in a way that is so holistic. You know, it's saying, you know, it's not it's not good enough for you to have that same level of basic education. You right. Know, yeah. Every everybody can can do math. Everybody can do science. Yeah. Right. But but we want to make you. Uh, we want to make you a better person. We want you to mm -hmm. understand, uh, you know, how to be the best version of yourself. Exactly. And, and I think sometimes the, the universities, uh, and I see this mostly like with like, you know, in our current situation, particularly like with state universities and in terms right. of and things like that, it becomes like a mill. You're just trying to grind out people. You know, mm -hmm. you want you want them in, you want them to get the degree, and you want them to get out. All right. Uh, and there, there's no, there is no concerted effort. There's no, uh, there's no, there's no emphasis from the infrastructure of the school that is saying the education is only the, the, the learning part is not just what you do in a classroom, you know, right. you know, we want you to come out and we want you to be, you know, uh, this, the future, we want you to be the future. Right. So, uh, yeah, I think that that is just so amazing. And so, uh, you know, I, I just wish I wish every school kind of had that that take. Yeah, I, I mean, I do, too. I, I'll i say that most H, most HBCUs seem to have that ingrained in it, because, as you said, it's not enough to just learn the, the, the basics, to just learn to have a regular liberal arts education um, at these colleges. The purpose when they were founded, number one, and we talk about Morehouse founded in 1867. When uh, when it was Atlanta Bible College, I believe, down in the basement of a church, the idea was just to take this time to teach black people how to read and teach them how to write and teach them the basic things that they, like you said, were not afforded the ability to do in normal society. But as time went on, the goal became to create teachers and preachers and create those kind of people that were going to kind of contribute to their communities. And then it changed into a school in which we're now creating lawyers, businessmen. And as the field stretched, the idea was to maintain that principle, creating leaders in the, in the community, no matter what you decide to do with your career, to still be able to turn around and show the next generation how to do the same thing. Or at least, you know, to open the, open the same doors that were open for you. Yeah. That's really the goal. And I, I, wish, um, I wish it were mirrored more. In society, because uh, at, at the time, I feel like the school was reflective 
of how black people were with each other in general. Yeah. You know, the idea of kind of helping each other out, you know, kind of we're, we're all we have. I feel like that essence has slipped on a national scale mm-hmm. and I can still see it here. And that's one of the reasons I pre- I'm, I'm at Morehouse now, actually. <laughs> and I, I can see it here on campus still amongst the faculty members, amongst the students when they deal with each other. So it, it really makes me appreciate this teaching environment so much so that it, it almost spoils me whenever I have to go anywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's the, you know, we, we have the idea of, of the higher version of ourselves and, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I think sometimes the adversity, adversity either binds you together or it tears you apart. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, I think that, that at that point, historically, uh, there were no options. You know, right. it was the only the only way to survive was to band together. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, you know, it, there's been these these cultural shifts, and yeah. you know, there's there is uh, w- regardless of whether you talk about within the within the black community or just in the world in general, we're seeing mm-hmm. how divisive uh, as as a species, not not as a race, but as a species, we've become. And it's right. it, it's you know, as we're dealing like with this coronavirus nonsense it's crazy if, if everybody would just hey let, let's all figure out what the best yeah, let, what's what's going to be the best solution and let's just all do it do it just do it yeah yeah exactly exactly so yeah. um but yeah you know, hey that's 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 completely different conversation <laughs> so, mm-hmm. it is it's, a, it's, yeah. it's an unfortunately drawn out conversation about something that i think could have been simple but you know yeah, well we, we are where we are <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, and all we can do is make the best of it, you know? That's yeah, all you can do, man. That's it. So, you know, in terms of, of uh, music mm-hmm. um, and you know, as, as relationship to, you know, your position there uh, at the university, um, you know, with with jazz particularly being uh, one of the, the great cultural uh gifts that that the the black community has has given to the world right uh, that uh it it's no surprise that that jazz has such an important place in a school like uh like uh, morehouse or or any of the other uh you know uh hbcs uh so what you know, when you're there, I mean, do you have that feeling? Do you ever have that feeling like, you know, you, you, you're standing, you're standing on the shoulders of those who came before you, but yeah. then you, you have that, do you ever have that feeling of like, oh my God, I'm responsible for keeping this going. You know, all of this has come mm-hmm. before me has been so great. Now I've got the mandal. What am I going to do with it? Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's funny you mentioned that because Morehouse has a phrase that share with all of the students from the beginning of their, their tenure here to the end, in which it states Morehouse essentially places a crown above the heads of his students for them to grow into. And when you think about some of the alumni, I guess one of the most well-known alumni is uh, Martin Luther King and uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And when, when that is kind of the standard, so to speak, the, the things that, I guess, the things we learned about Martin Luther King here I believe are different than what most of the world know about him. And, you know, kind of the same way I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, originally the, the things we know about Elvis are much different than the rest of the world. Right. So, you know, it, it I, I think what has happened over time is you, you have alumni who accomplish amazing things, but the unfortunate side effect of that is that they kind of get placed on a pedestal. Mm-hmm. And once they're there, I think it becomes impossible for the next person to believe that they can accomplish the same things that those people accomplished. But, you know, at this college, you know, from the time that I was a student until now, and Morehouse is also home to um, to Martin Luther King collection. And you you get to see some of his writing, some of the speeches that don't get as much attention as the I have a dream speech, some of the speeches that other people wrote for him, as well as the ones that he wrote. You get a greater picture. Of, of Martin Luther King just as a regular man who was able to do extraordinary things. And once you have that view, once you establish that that is in fact who he is, once you, you, you kind of get a different view of your heroes. 
to where you believe you can do the things your heroes can do. That's the place to be. Yeah. And that, that's what I appreciate here. When you take a figure that's kind of larger than life, there's a huge statue of him um, in the middle of campus. Uh, when you take a person who is, you know, has holidays around the world, but you realize that this was a father first, this was a husband, this was a student, this was someone's son, someone's friend who would hang out every now and then, who still managed against all odds to stick to his, you know, stick to his particular views in the face of some of the worst forms of actual oppression. Not somebody telling them to wear a mask, but somebody putting a water hose on them, just walking yeah. out, sicking dogs on them, you know, beating a man within an inch of his life. That to still look at those people and say, I forgive you. You yeah. know, this is, you know, this because we need to be, we need to be one. We need to understand that we are one and the same. Yeah. You know, to know that that can come from a regular person, it, it really puts it in a perspective to what we can and should do. And I, I appreciate that. And so when we talk about it from a jazz point of view, it's no different at all. Right. Because when I when I was a student here, I had the opportunity to perform with Clark Terry, uh, with Ray Charles, with uh, this when he was still with us, um, with who, Antonio Hart. Um, uh, you know, this the, the list goes on. We had a jazz festival, but we also had artists who would just pop up every now and then. Mm -hmm. And even when I came back as band director to keep that tradition going, once I realized the type of work that the previous band director was putting into that, you know, it made me appreciate it that much more. But it was definitely the pressure to provide for my students the same kind of experience that I got. And I feel like that is is kind of my truest calling. Uh, in serving on a faculty here is just to provide them with the opportunities to see that more is possible within their own skin. Right. And you know, the, the world doesn't really like to tell us that. And so, I, I, again, a place like this and in pretty much any HBCU, you're going to find, you know, different versions of the same experience. But I just think these schools are, you know, they're still they're still important. They're still viable. Mm -hmm. and that comes into question a lot from people who haven't experienced that. Yeah. And so, I, you know, I, I, I like to see what happens here, though, because yeah. you can't deny how different you walk on the campus and see, you know, 300 black men passing by in suit and tie. That's going to give you a different vibe than walking down the street, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah very true. Right. And, you know, you, you sort of touch on this in terms of uh, the concept like jazz and, and, you know, obviously, you know, this this is a, a you know, a trumpet based uh thing that we're doing here um mm -hmm. and uh you know the the importance of understanding that you know the greats and this is a big part of, of what i'm trying to do with this podcast that you know the people that we look up to and you know look at their accomplishments and you're inspired by it's too easy to go well but they were special you know, right. And I can't do that, you know, so, you know, I, I, I can't do what Dizzy did. I can't do what Miles did. I can't do, mm -hmm. can't, you know, I can't do what Sean Jones does, you know, you mm -hmm. know, when I, I, there's a, a saying and something, don't, don't compare your, your chapter one with someone else's chapter, you know, whatever. That is a great <laughs> saying. Yeah. And I think that sometimes we miss sight of the fact that, everyone has had their struggles. Everyone started somewhere. Mm -hmm. And also like, you know, saying like putting people on a pedestal, you know, we, we tend to do that, the people that we admire and uh, you know, it, they are, you know, everybody is some, like you said, someone's mother's uh, yeah, someone, someone's son, you know, someone's uh, friend, someone's, you know, wh whatever, you know, that there are people, we're all people. And, you know, when we can understand that, then we find that that common ground that we can start to have the real conversations that will move us forward, either in terms of uh, the development of our music uh, yeah. or, you know, development of our society. So I think we've, we've just got to get past that. So right. in, in, in terms of, of like your experiences, because you've had to you, you got a chance to, to work with so many different people over the years. So, you know, uh, yeah. Um, who were some of the people that that you kind of had those kind of you know epiphany moments of, wow, you know the this this guy had this really cool lesson for me, and I can take this and I can help this to to move me to the next place that I want to be. Um, you know, there's been a lot of moments like that. I, 
like I said, I've been, you know, one of the most profound experiences, I'll say this, and he, he doesn't always get, um, I don't think he always gets the kind of credit he deserves for the things he really does, but working with Tyler Perry has, um, that, that I have to say is an experience in itself because this is one of the richest, you know, black men on earth, essentially. He's got his hands in every media pot possible. Uh, one of the first faces you see, and also one of the most hated, <laughs> you know, by, by the same people that love him. And yeah. so um, I think the thing that I, I learned from working with him, though, I started working with him over 10 years ago. And this is uh, when he had a different studio. And the people that I worked with had been with him since the beginning when he was still sleeping in his car and kind of, uh, you know, asking people if they work for free and sometimes, you know, just not able to pay people, you know, that to see where he is now. And I, I still do work with him from time to time in different different settings. But to see where he is now is the truest testament to me of what it means to just have stick to itiveness more than anything else. Cause that's what it is. This, this man is a definite workaholic, you know, yeah. but to know that I, I think I hear the best that everything is hard. You know, if, if you want to, if you want to be successful, it's hard. If you want to work a regular job and not be successful, that's hard. You know, if you want to be fit, that's hard. If you want to be fat, that's hard. You know, that the idea that you choose which type of hard you have, cause it's mm -hmm. all going to take something out of you when it's all said and done. Right. But to see how he works while he's working and still manages to, uh, um, you know, to to keep a, a, a really calm temperament and a respectful tone and to seriously still be appreciative of all that he has while he's still gaining. I think all of that puts into perspective for me people that say they can't do certain things because it doesn't get any more can't than what he was before he became a mogul. Yeah. And now that he is where he is, the. Like I said, I've been working with him for over 10 years. He's still the same person he was 10 years ago. So to, to see somebody that in the midst of it all can still be appreciative and still respect people that he doesn't know, still address everybody, you know, on the level in a room, no matter where you're meeting him. You know, that's that strikes me as the type of quality that, you know, people should strive for in general. Right. The other thing that came from working with him and this just comes from working in the music industry and you'll get this part because this is all musicians when you end up in certain work situations that may not be the most favorable whether it be money and i heard it put best recently that there's um most of the times there is not a single show gig or opportunity that can pay you what you're worth that's not the way they work so once you say yes to that opportunity you still treat it with your you treat it with your utmost as if this is a million dollar gig no matter what because you don't know where that's going to lead my introduction to tyler perry came through doing pro bono work for him and the next thing i know i was doing the tour with him and so that that has kind of been the case with uh, all of my best opportunities they've come from these epiphany moments where i realize how you treat the stuff that seems like it doesn't matter is what makes you worthy of the stuff that does mm. and so you know those I, I just feel like this 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 industry is just full of these beautiful life lessons. Like I said, Trump and his life. But yeah. um, you know, how you treat one thing is generally how you're gonna treat everything. Right. So if if you take that approach with the things that even to you might not seem like they matter that much, then that creates a habit that will open up the door for you to get to that thing that will matter right. to you. Right. Yeah, I'm with you 100%. Yeah, one of my one of my favorite sayings is, uh, and you, you can use it in a variety of situations, is how you do anything is how you do everything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the one connotation of it is uh, that there is there there's kind of a universal principle that underlies everything. And, you know, the Chinese call it the Tao. Yeah. And yeah. we understand that the way things work, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, the, the, the secrets of success to being a successful trumpet player are no different than being a successful uh, you know, baseball player or to be right. a successful CEO of a, of a company. Mm -hmm. They're all the same thing. Success is success is success. Exactly. Well, you know, granted, there there are are specific uh, there there are some specific details and techniques that have to be uh, adopted and adapted to, but the the fundamental concepts are going to remain universal. Um, mm -hmm. the, the second part of it is the that's the I, I always refer to it as the dark side. The dark side of it is 
is that uh, your your attitude will be consistent as well. So if you've got if you've got a poor attitude about uh, you know like like gigs, you're saying you know if if, if you if you uh, only give your best when you're getting you know the best back then right. that that shows your character it just you know and and that's going to eventually it's going to eventually come a point where that comes to the surface yeah you, know, you can right. hide it for a while but you know it's going to come to the surface eventually so um you know it's like treating learning to treat every person every opportunity uh, every situation from your center, from your core, from, you know, from, from who you truly are. Uh, mm-hmm. And if you do that, you know, I, I really believe things are going to work out for you, you know, in the end. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah. So, you know, uh, with, with your uh, approach to, um, to trumpet, uh, let, you know, let's, we're kind of, we've been on the education tip. So yeah. for just a second, uh, right. just about the education, yeah, the, the way you approach uh, teaching trumpet, uh, mm-hmm. Because like you said, trumpet is life. So uh, yes. you know, some people are just like, okay, you know, here's how you here's how you do this. Here's how you play this etude. Here's how you play these changes. That doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, so, that so how, do, how do you approach it? You know, my um, my trumpet professor. Uh, I, I studied with William Fielder up at Rutgers. It was funny you mentioned Sean because we were roommates, and you know, we came in together, and you know, that's 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 literally one of my best friends, who also happens to be one of my favorite trumpet players. Um, what's but we, we both studied with William Fielder for our graduate studies to get our master's degree. And the thing that his, 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 the core of his teaching had to do with showing you things in a way that you could show him. You know, basically, I give instruction in a way that my students can teach me the same material. And that's how I know that they get a grip on it. But the, um, the, I guess, also at the core of my teaching, where I think I might have deferred from our professor, uh, I like to think that you're playing as a combination of different teachings and different lessons and different theories that you come across. So for my students, I like to give them more of an explorative nature on the instrument. Because most of it, you know, when, when you're dealing with black students particularly, and this, this isn't discussed often, at least not often enough, I consider your playing to be a combination of theories, of uh, lessons, of different things that you've learned over the years. I don't think there's any, you know, there's no one way to skin a cat, so to speak. Right. So with, with that being the case, I like to encourage my students to explore things because the way uh, Fielder, the way Prof would work with us, he would tell us to purposely figure out how to do things wrong so that we could figure out how to do them the right way. Right. Anytime he would point out bad habits, he would want us to recreate those habits and kind of over exaggerate so that you know exactly what's going on. Because the, the general concept with the trumpet is you can't see the mechanics that go into playing. Mm-hmm. You know, a piano player can look at his, he can look at his fingers, a drummer can watch his hands, can fix his posture. But with trumpet, so much is internal that you have to get used to what it feels like to have both bad and good habits to know when something needs to be, cor- be corrected. Right. And so uh, he, it was a series of things, you know, in terms of just just learning how what it really means to sing through the instrument, you know, and all of that you mentioned um, of about life lessons, but it, it directly correlates with how you handle life because there's, when I say there's no one way, what you find in life is that a problem can have many different solutions. And that, you know, even, you know, we, <laughs> we brought up COVID a second ago. Mm-hmm. There's, there's a lot of different ways to get to the right place. All right. There, there are different ways to get to the right place, but every single way involves some sort of action on your part. So when we're talking about trumpet playing, when we're talking about life, you know, you could say that while you're playing, maybe the notes aren't sounding a certain way. There are so many different factors that go into your sound that that's when you explore each thing individually. You decide, is it my air? Is it how I'm moving the air? Am I putting too much air into the instrument? Am I directing that, that wind appropriately? You know, there, there are so many different things that, that make up the mechanics of playing that with my students, I like to give them the opportunity to explore their own habits and realize what it is that they should maybe keep and what should go. And then every now and then, once I see them really start to develop their own and find their way, that's when I start to, to deal with it in a more technical aspect. You know, well, now that you've discovered that it takes wind to play the trumpet, let's discuss ways to build up your wind. Let's discuss different ways 
ways to move the wind that you built. And let's discuss how much of that wind is necessary to do the types of things that you want to do. Mm -hmm. Because in, in the end, the teaching philosophy is that you learn how to play the trumpet. And once you get to a certain level of proficiency, you should be able to play whatever type of music it is you want to play. So I'm, I don't consider myself trained jazz trumpeters or classical trumpeters or legit or whatever the little titles people like to put on the music. I, I think like, yeah, I'm going to show you how to play this instrument. And with all of the things that it takes to learn how to play and enjoy playing the instrument, that's going to guide you, hopefully, to whatever it is you do next. Because not everybody's even meant to be a musician that comes to my studio. But music is such an overarching term when you deal with the career of it all. So I'm like, man, you learn how to play this instrument properly. And it's no telling what the skills will do for you. But you have to take care of this thing for it to take care of you. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's that's really great. I really love that philosophy. Um, I I. I used something similar to that um, when I was, I was, you know, was a, a, a full-time martial arts instructor for a brand of random martial arts studio for about 30 years. Wow. And um, one of the things that I used to do w in terms of problem solving for people, because so many of the things were the, the, the mistakes that you saw were external manifestations. Okay. Yeah. But mm -hmm. the pro that, that's not the problem. That was just, yeah. You know, it, exactly. so trying to get to the what what's causing the problem. And that was that required me to actually get it, try to get into the minds of people. Yeah. And so I, when someone would have a problem doing something, I, I would find myself imitating them and trying to get my body to move like their body's moving, going, mm -hmm. well, how do I have to think to make mm -hmm. that happen? And then once I could exactly. get that, it's like, oh, this is why you're having that problem. Think about doing this movement in this way. And yeah. I'm like, well, how, how can you read my mind? I'm like, well, I'm not, I'm, I'm just re reverse engineering things. Yeah. And, you know, and, and trying to teach people how to do that for themselves, because I think ultimately that's what we have to do. If we want to make mm -hmm. the most progress on whatever it is in life, right. we have to learn how to be our own best teachers. We have to be our, our, our problem solver. And that requires the ability to uh, look with a very, uh, kind of non-judgmental approach to what we're doing it's mm -hmm. you know, it's it's not horrible i mean it, it's not what you want but it's not the end of the right. world so let's just let's just get the emotions out of it and let's just say this is this is what i want this is what i'm getting how do i how do i get these two to to match up so right yeah that's 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 really deep now you know i've had a number of conversations with people, uh, both, uh, you know, in real life and online and things like that. This, this is one of those topics that can get, get can create a lot of controversy. Um, but it has to do with uh, the three parts, at least this is my opinion. There, there are three parts to being a great trumpet player. Um, uh, and people tend to focus on the last two. Uh, I think the end of the chain is the horn. It's the equipment. It's the gear, uh, you know, right. th because that that's the amplifier for what you're doing. Uh, right. Then, then the middle portion is, I think, where a lot of people also get stuck. It's the technique. So whether it be you know the 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 facility of of the fingers, the articulation, whether it be the range or any of those things, those are the things that give you the ability to more seamlessly express your music. But I think the thing right. that most people miss is that core principle, that most foundation thing, which mm -hmm. is music is something that's going on in your head and in your heart. Right. Yeah, and if this isn't right, then even if you have the best technique in the world or the mm -hmm. best gear in the world, you're not gonna be able to produce the, great, the best music because music is emotion. Music is, is not just, you know, uh, a series of notes and a series of rhythms music to be right. pure music needs to be something that touches the heart. And if you don't have feeling, how can you ever hope to express feeling? If you don't have creative ideas, how can you ever hope to express uh, this kind of, uh, you know, new sound? So right. uh, how do you approach the mental aspect of the development, the, the mental emotional aspect of development as a, of, a, of playing the horn? Yeah. So there, there is a level of maturity that comes with deciding that you have more control over things than you give yourself credit for. 
So when it comes to the instrument, one thing that I encourage them to understand is that there are things that happen. There are things that are habit. There are things that are instinct. And then there are things that you can actually control. Once they find, or I don't always even have to help with this, but once they find out which of these things they're doing instinctively, whether they be good or bad, once they figure out what those things are, it generally makes it into an easier transition for them to understand the control that they do have. Because oftentimes I'll tell the student, um, I was like, all right, I want you to play. Oh, okay. Let's let's take it from a technical aspect. When you think of um, when you think of the Gordon method, the Clyde Gordon method, dealing with tongue level placement. Mm-hmm. I'll tell them, and this doesn't work for everyone, mind you. But I'll tell them, generally speaking, what you do with your tongue, we treat your tongue, we treat the tongue as like a fourth valve on the instrument. Mm-hmm. So what you do with your tongue is going to dictate how low or high you play. That could also dictate how loud you play. That could also dictate your actual tone. You could literally change your tone just by either flattening your tongue out or curling it up, raising up the front end of the tone, raising up the back or the middle of it. All of that makes a huge difference. So now once you understand that you can control what notes you hit based upon what you say, once they get to that portion and realize that you say, ah, you're going to play a pitch here and say E, then that arch, wherever it happens in your tongue naturally, is going to take you to a different pitch. Now, let's control that by purposely saying I and E. Now that you know where that pitch is, when you say E, always say that and you should always be able to get that note once you combine all the other elements. Once they start to get to that point, I think that that that, that creates a different kind of confidence level that helps them to develop the other things that come with the trumpet. But just that one lesson alone, that one basic thing, I, I see I see faces light up from child to adult mm-hmm. to just realize, oh, you know, there were so many things that were just happening before, but now this is easy. And once it's easy and it's enjoyable, that usually gives them the eye, that, that, that gives them that extra push to do the rest of the work that comes with really developing this stuff. Mm-hmm. But again, it's, it's about helping them just kind of parse through and separate instinct from control Mm -hmm. and the second we get to that portion i you know i've I've seen so many students successfully you know find themselves doing things that they had no idea that they could do on the horn yeah and and i feel like that translates you know that that translates into other things that i see because again i I say it all the time um i I guess i've been teaching now for about 20 years almost it's just crazy but with that i've seen some students go on to be wildly successful in so many other fields. And when they come back to me and thank me for the things that I showed them on trumpet, I'm, I'm at a loss for words because I, I think to myself, man, I, you know, you're the one that went off and started a Fortune 500 company. But in the end, there's, you know, and it's not just my teaching. You know, Morehouse has a combination of amazing professors and different scholars that come in and influence these kids, but for them to even put me in that vein, just based upon what they learned on the trumpet as a contributing factor to the successes that they found in their adult life. It lets me know there's something to that connection you right. know, between life and music. Yeah. Yeah. That that's, that's great stuff. Um, you know, earlier you mentioned something and I kind of want to get back to this because y- y- you mentioned it and it's like, Oh, I want to talk about this. And, and we kind of went <laughs> in a different direction, but you were talking about, um, you know, the differences, like the, the physiological differences, uh, yeah. particularly in terms of if you look at you know, the, the the different general structures uh, of different ethnicities uh, right. and, and how, uh, you know, particularly, you know, for for uh, for black, you know, African-American, have, however you want to however you want to say it, uh, you mm-hmm. know, having, uh, you know, thicker lips, uh, you know, having uh, certain structures that are you know, the, the way that, that the teaching, the pedagogy was set up, the way the, the, the instrument was designed was not necessarily con, uh, conducive to uh, the basic setup. So, you know, having how you, right. how you have to adopt and adapt things. Um, and so, I, because yeah, you know, I've got, you know, I, I've had a lot of problems over my career, uh, mostly because uh, I have a, a odd, jaw structure so i have an underbite have a a distinct underbite um and and so the way that i approach the horn it you know a lot of the things that uh you know like a um uh some of the more standard uh approaches to trumpet that doesn't work for me 
Right. Now, right. Something like like uh, uh, the uh, the Stevens method, the Stevens Costello mm-hmm. method. That works perfect for me because, you know, what, what Roy Stevens was always talking about is like, oh, well, you want to push your lower jaw forward. And you want to have a, a slightly lower set. And those are the things that I do naturally because of the structure of of my yeah. jaw. But mm-hmm. that creates a difference in the way that my tongue works because the oral cav- cavity exactly. is actually completely different. Exactly. So, you know, I, I just find it interesting that, that you brought that up. And I want to, I just want to have you riff on that a little bit more because okay. I think there are so many players out there that are running into difficulties because uh, unfortunately they, they're not blessed with having a teacher like you that, that has this, <laughs> this more global concept of, of what it means to be a trumpet player and to be a teacher. Uh, so, you know, what kind of advice would you give to people in terms of like, you know, going back with that, that self-analysis and, and playing around mm-hmm. with stuff? Uh, what are some of the tips that you would give to, to people that are, that are maybe not finding the more traditional uh, methodologies working for them? All right. You know, there's, um, and, and I'm glad you said what you said for a couple of reasons, because I know, I, I remember you mentioning that in your particular heritage, you have a, a mixture of both Black and Mexican, um, Mexican background. I, I think what's interesting is that you will find that dialect even makes a huge difference with how you play the instrument. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know a lot of times people attribute, you know, like some of the, the mariachi musicians or even some of the South American musicians, some, some of the things that they play in terms of range and interpretation. A lot of that has to do with the language itself, with words that they're already accustomed to saying which is, uh, you know, is different than the English language, which is different than the French language. Like some of that French literature is crazy. Yeah. But even that dialect, what they what, what you have to do with your tongue when you're speaking makes a huge difference with how it's going to play out on the instrument. But you brought up a, a bunch of really interesting points when we're talking about physiology, your oral cavity makes a huge difference. And one of the um, one of the greatest examples of this to me is probably John Faddis. You know, Faddis has that he has the, 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 the gap between his, his two top teeth there. Mm-hmm. And he tells a story that's hilarious. You know, he. He played with that for years and that that does something different for him in terms of just shooting the air through the instrument. And uh, that's one of the things that he always attributes to his range and his durability with that. And he said, um, you know, after years and years of having that particular feature, he decided to go to uh, an oral surgeon, uh, you know, to get that corrected. And he said after it was corrected, after they redid, you know, remolded his his smile, he could no longer play. (laughs) <laughs> so he had to go back to the doctor to get them to recap <laughs> so that, he, you know, he can maintain that. Um, so I'm saying that because there are other players who don't have that feature who can still do some of the things that Fattis does. So I, when it comes to an individual's players, you have to discover your own strengths and your own weaknesses. You know, there's a possibility that playing center and downstream is not going to work with you simply because of what's going on back here behind your teeth. And for me, you know, I've um, I've never been a complete on center player because I I dabbled in boxing when I was in high school, which was a bad idea as a trumpet player. But, yeah. you know, that was the thing I did. And as a result, you know, we all know the scar tissue does not buzz. Mm-hmm. So my embouchure had to adjust to account for the tissue that just could not be involved in playing. And once I discovered the thing that worked for me, I've always found that once a student finds their strengths, if it's not something that's detrimental, the best thing a teacher can do for that student is learn how to work with that. But the second we start getting into embouchure changes, you know, it's not always worth the setback that comes with it because you could literally discourage a student from playing completely mm-hmm. over that setback. The idea is to understand, though, if like like you say with the with the underbite, if you have that thing going on, then you just have to adjust your mouthpiece you know, your position to account for what you're doing here, unless you're, you know, die hard and want to get some kind of surgical fix, which I don't think is necessary because great players, you know, they're, they're, they're not made the same. They're, yeah. they're just not, it's just a fact of nature. And when we look in even the classical realm now, I see the players whose, whose bells are directed, you know, down here, but they sound great and they do amazing things on horns. And I see the upstream players and it's, it's, it's just another debate that doesn't change anything in the end. Mm -hmm. What you do is you just figure out your strengths and you figure out the most effective way to move the air into the instrument. And the the common denominator that I found often has to do with mouthpiece size. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times, you know, the trumpet, you get your first trumpet, it comes with a seven C mouthpiece. Again, that was made for a specific 
you know, a specific person that was considered to be standard when that was standardized. Right. But once you do start dealing with other features, I've had some students who've experienced a huge shift in their playing just by switching to a wider rim so that they can deal with more of the flesh of their embouchure being involved in the buzz. It changes their sound, it changes durability, that changes flexibility, you know, and all of that is just, a, that's, a, that's a simple fix, that's a quick fix. So I think, um, you know, when we're dealing with, with Black people, another thing that happens is we generally don't get a lot of private instruction before college when it comes to the instrument. That's not a, um, that's not a standard when it comes to younger Black students. So by the time I see students here at Morehouse or at a lot of the high schools that I would travel to to, to do clinics and lessons, um, I kind of have to supplement that. Because when I worked for other institutions, the freshmen came in with a repertoire list, <laughs> mm -hmm. with an etude list, with a, a list of books and different studies from different countries, and they were ready to move beyond that. But sometimes when I receive students, even here, I find that we have to not necessarily play catch up as much as supplement the things that they would have learned from those books to give them the opportunity to explore those books. Mm -hmm. And, and with that, the, the realization is that, hey, man, you know, that leg up that that, you know, that we perceive with them is literally meant to be a motivation for us. Yeah. You know, when it, when it comes to most things, we feel like we have to do we have to be twice as good, twice as fast, right. you know, twice as attentive. And it's no different when it comes to trumpet. You have to understand that now that you have twice the material to work with here on your face, <laughs> You're going to have to adjust some things to get the same results. And mouthpiece size, that start, that's the first thing. Once you figure out how much of your embouchure is supposed to go in there and how much of the rest of your facial you know, tissue is supposed to contribute to what is in there, you know, that that's when you start playing. That's, that's really the beginning. Yeah. So. yeah. Uh, that, that's, that, that's cool because, you know, I, I think that, uh, yeah, everyone is going to be you know, they're, they're unique. So every, mm -hmm. every situation is going to require a, a, a different solution. Right. However, there are more probable causes. Uh, you know, you, you, you get good at diagnosing things. I mean, just like a yeah. doctor, you know, a lot of times a doctor doesn't have to do all the tests. He just, you know, right. looks and goes, Oh, well, you've got this, you know, mm -hmm. more than likely. And it's like, we're going yeah. to treat this. And then if that doesn't work, then we'll move on to these next things. Right. So, you know, the, I think that the thing of, uh, you know, using a slightly larger mouthpiece or, you know, doing, doing something like that with the, with the, the placement, uh, certainly I think that that would be kind of like a, almost like a no brainer kind of, you know, that, 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 you would think, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but, um, but being careful not to, you know, use it as, you know, a, a one size fits all solution. Exactly. Um, and I think that, that one of the, the tendencies is, uh, to, is to make wholesale change. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, like when I was in college, that's what what happened to me is, you know, my professor, uh, you know, my, my sound was not what it should have been. And, you know, I know that and I can accept that now. But now I can also look back and especially after years of, of being able to uh, study with and talk with, you know, really great players mm -hmm. and teachers of saying, you know, there were there were really some simple solutions that were out there that could have, could have given me what I was looking for instead right. of uh, change your embouchure, change your mouthpiece, change your horn, mm -hmm. you know, and just completely, you know, having to start from scratch. Yes. So yes. Uh, I'm a big believer, just like with a scientific method of, you know, you change one variable at a time, you, you, you mm -hmm. tweak one thing. And yep. if, if that works great, then we tweak the next thing. If that doesn't work, mm -hmm. then, you know, you, you haven't created, you, you haven't broken the system. Right. You know, you know? so uh, other than, than uh, mouthpiece, like what are, yeah. what are some of the other more common uh, issues that you see and, you know, some of the, the more simplistic solutions that, that are available? Man, the, the most common, the, <laughs> Definitely the, the one thing that I see most consistently has to do with wind more than anything else. And I think um, that this, again, goes back to having the one, one thing I loved about studying with Prof is that everything he did was based on concept. It was never based on, you know, you need to do this one thing. You need to do this thing. It was always about concept. You need to have a concept underlying everything mm -hmm. and allow that to guide the decisions you make individually to do the things that you want to do and play the things that you hear. And so with that being the case, the concept 
of addressing just calling it wind instead of calling it air already makes a huge difference. Right. You know, and so oftentimes what I found with students is that they're, they're just forgetting to breathe. And when when it comes time to play, let's let's put it in an audition setting. You know, we, we we've performed enough to know how to deal with ang- like performance anxiety. The idea is that once you go on the stage, about 50 percent of everything that, you know, instantly goes out of the window. And so you have to practice in a way to make that additional 50 percent second nature. So once you get that blank, it doesn't make a difference. The second you blank out, you're still doing something that you can already do by rope. And that's the way that's the way we practice. When it comes to when that's one of the first things that students and professionals like tend to forget especially depending on one style or another. Jazz is an interesting beast in itself because once you're improvising, once you're on the page of thinking about that, oftentimes a lot of the basics of playing the instrument simply go away. (laughs) And you find yourself doing all kinds of things that are considered bad habits, maybe destructive to your playing, that maybe sabotage your ability to to play a full set. You know, all of that comes into play the second you're you're thinking so much about, you know, what line, what chord changes this. What do I want to say over this? So the idea of when I ingrain that into my students and I, I tell them a story all the time. The thing that Prof did with me and with Sean and there was another trumpet player, that phenomenal cat named Lee Hogan's at the time. And the thing that Prof did with all of us for the entire first year of our study, he would not allow us to play anything beyond concert F in the staff. That was it. That one note. And if that note was not perfect on demand at the beginning of your lesson, sometimes that's the end of your lesson for the day. <laughs> and, and we were, you know, we, we were hanging out a lot during that first year and we would get around each other and, you know, the, the prof let you get past that note. Nah, man, I'm still on that one note. <laughs> and that, that was for an entire academic year of study. But what that did to us is forced us to learn that you have to breathe in a certain way. And the mistake that most musicians make is after they've taken in their wind, however they breathe in, because that can defer. However you breathe in, you want to instantly put that wind into the instrument or else it loses the momentum you built up with your inhale. Mm-hmm. That's the first thing that always happens. One habit that's, that's huge is a guy would bring their, you know, to bring their trumpet to their lips. They're ready to play. They'll take this breath and kind of hold it for a second. And then when it's time to play, release the air. When they do that, what they've done is now taken away whatever power, whatever attack they built up now is inconsistent. So the first thing that most of my students have to unlearn or learn rather is how to create a swing like effect, like the air goes straight in and straight out teaching people how to breathe in rhythm with the music that they're playing. You know, it's almost like yoga, but mm-hmm. the idea is if you have a count in, if they're going to count to four and you're coming in on beat one, then beat number four is your breath and beat number one, you're playing. And so that just getting them to that point is that that's a lesson in itself. But that, that I found that to be, a, a you know, almost a universal corrector. Because most of what you find is that initial attack is damaged by so many different another Another portion, when I talk about wind and just moving the wind, the embouchure sometimes, if the embouchure is not prepared, before the wind hits it, then it's not going to respond consistently. Mm-hmm. Like sometimes you get a note, sometimes you won't. <laughs> and so the idea of prepping your embouchure, you know, before you take that breath, not necessarily having everything tightened, but at least having maybe 75% of your embouchure engaged and ready to go before you take that breath, that makes a difference on what consistently happens afterwards. So that, it, but still it's the idea of moving your wind. Most of the times, the, you know, the, the good and the bad that happens with the trumpet happens behind your teeth. And so that, that next portion having to deal with what you're saying, which dictates the wind. If, if, if your wind was traffic, then your tongue is the traffic director, right? Mm-hmm. So if you don't have any control over what your tongue is doing, then there's no telling whether or not that wind will even make it past your lips and into the horn. So now the idea becomes to say certain things. And this is where we get to the point of being able to control both your inhale, your exhale, and your sound just by what you say. Mm-hmm. And Prov's whole thing is he had syllables for how you breathe in. Like we, we could do this now, and you probably already do this, but 
he breathes in uh, one way that people breathe is saying like ha, another way is saying ho, but mm-hmm. that H portion of it is what kind of opens up your throat and forces that air in. Mm-hmm. So when you, <gasps> when you, <gasps> when you do that, you feel the sensation of the wind coming in. Mm-hmm. That's when you know that you, you've already got a good habit going now that you, you can feel the air coming in. And that's, that's a consistent thing that you can recreate every time you're about to play. Mm-hmm. And the next thing is just getting that air out. And it's making sure that even from a syllable point of view, that there's nothing between that ha and whatever you say to play. So it's like ha too, almost like a sneeze, <sighs> you know, and the air instantly shoots out. And once you get in the habit of doing that, then you get in the habit of creating a consistent sound on demand, a consistent attack on demand. And that, you know, that, that, that can, that can start a chain of events that goes great for you from that point forward. But that's the thing that has to be taught. That's the one thing that I see consistently that it's not taught. So mm-hmm. by the time I see trumpet players, even adults, my even working adults, um, and they bring up issues of inconsistency, you know, like you said, as a doctor, you know, addressing one thing at a time, I found more often than not, it has to do with, how they're initially getting that wind into their instrument. If they don't have a concept of breathing and playing and they're just kind of going off instinct, then sometimes it'll work and sometimes it won't. But I guess for for my personal career, I've been in so many situations where the red light is on, you have to get it right now or it'll never happen again. You know, it's being recorded, so it'll be immortalized. Yeah. They're live on TV. <laughs> you know, I've been in so many of those situations that I had to force myself and remind myself that this is how I play before the, before the count off comes, I need to do this. And every time I kind of pep talk myself into doing the right things, Mm -hmm. the right things happen. So, you know, it's that I know it was kind of a long and drawn out answer, but it it still leads back to, to wind and having just a concept, you know? Yeah. Well, and you know, it's real interesting that, you know, when you're talking about how, uh, particularly like in, in the context of, of playing jazz. You know, so if you, when you're improvising and, and your, your mind is, is so focused on, on that and, and it certainly can happen in any, any type of musical situation, but mm-hmm. it's so easy to, uh, you know, because your, your brain only has the, well, your, your brain has thousands. It, it's processing. Uh, I think like it's a, uh, Five, over 500,000 bits of information every second. Wow. Um, now, your conscious mind can only process uh, about, you know, one, one <laughs> percent of that. Yeah. You know? So that's why you, you basically can only, you can only focus on one thing at a time. I mean, that's, right. and that's the definition of focus. So you can really only think about one thing at a time. And when you're really Correct. thinking about something, then uh, the things that are going on other than that, the, that are part of the default mode network are the things that are ingrained. Those are the habits. Uh, sometimes mm-hmm. they're, the, they're the habits that, that you did not consciously choose. They're just, you know, the bad stuff. Or it's right. the habits that you consciously have chosen, uh, dedicated yourself to develop those things of so their second nature. Right. Because whenever you run into a stressful situation, you will always default to what you know best. Right. Those, those most ingrained habits. And I think sometimes with, with problems with breathing, that's one of the things because uh, we kind of have an ingrained habit. Uh, it's an instinctive habit of when you get nervous, you breathe in, you breathe in shallow. And shorter breaths, breath. yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's your body's natural reaction. It, it's part of the fight or flight mechanism. Right. You know, the sympathetic nervous system is, is, is getting geared up. So, mm-hmm the you know being able to have a new paradigm that you have which is when you when you're dealing with a a stressful situation or i don't want to say stressful is a bad thing but you know when you when you have to be on you know of okay this is when i need to breathe in (laughs) right and fuller so i need to do the opposite of what i normally would you know what i would instinctively do so developing a new instinct so that that makes complete sense to me from like from a neuropsych uh perspective that Mm -hmm. you know that is that's going to be the thing that we that we default to and then that's the thing that creates this kind of snowball effect exactly we develop the the anxiety we have poor performance and that just creates more and more and more and more so yeah 
And, you know, I, I think it's interesting that you even that you take it from that approach, because I, I tell people all the, all the time, the trumpet is such a head game in the end. Like the brass instruments in general are such head games. You have to um, you, you can psych yourself out of doing things you know how to do. Yeah. But looking on the inverse, you can trick yourself into doing things that you had no idea you can do by simply creating this environment where you're accomplishing what you meant to accomplish. And that's why I, I, I spend a great deal of time, not like my professor, but I do spend, I spend a great deal of time with my students just on the initial breath. Even like people that give speeches professionally, one tactic that they would always tell, you know, amateurs or, or you know, beginners or novice when it comes to giving a speech, one tactic to get people past their initial anxiety is to get them to kind of shout out the first word of the speech, you know, to kind of try to release as much tension as possible at the beginning of the speech. When it comes to trumpet, that first breath, you know, and when you're on a stage, rather, or when you're before an audience, that first breath is the most stress that you will have on a gig. If you find a way to get past that initial stress, like you said, it snowballs into doing, you know, the rest of the gig more comfortably. Mm -hmm. And the second breathing, the second that becomes ingrained, that generally tends to create more comfortable performers or people who are just, you know, that, that turn out to be more adept to playing. And I, I like to make it a point to listen to that first note of any performance that I ever listen to, any concert that I get to see, anytime I'm watching a jury or a recital, that first note tends to tell me how the rest of this piece is going to go. Yeah. And so, you know, if, if people can just concentrate on that one step and there's tons of Disney songs. I have three young children, so I've seen every Disney movie under the sun. And <laughs> there are tons of songs. There are tons of their songs that just address taking that first step. Mm -hmm. You know, taking that one baby move that will, you know, blossom into your adulthood. And I, I, I like to think that wind is that thing. And I have seen that consistently work, you know, for for nearly every student I've worked with. Mm -hmm. And that that, that kind of opens the door for everything else. So, yeah, I, I think that, that, you know, sometimes people lose track of the, the site that, you know, uh, well, yeah, we're brass instruments, but we're, you know, we are wood wind. You know, we're brass wind. We're yeah, so we're wind mm -hmm. instruments. Uh and exactly you know that's where it's got to start you know the the the, the yes. physical process starts with with your air with your wind with your breath and uh you know mm -hmm. uh, correct uh, a a lot of the work that i do in terms of being uh as as a, a consultant uh for for different organizations things with concepts of mindfulness and uh, you know, uh, success and, and, and those sort of things is right. that um, your intention, your intention drives everything. Your, you know, the way, what you think, how you think, uh, and this relates to the words you say, like, you know, that's why words are so important, you know, yeah. not only in the, in the terms of, of how uh, we've discussed it in terms of playing, but also just, you know, in life in general, the words that you use are just the expression of your, of your inner dialogue. And uh, if your words are constantly negative, well, guess what? That means you got a lot of negative thoughts. So you, you need to, yeah. you, you want to get positive results and you need to change your vocabulary. Mm -hmm. um, but it starts here, but the connection between your thoughts and every other process is your breath. Right. It's, it's, it's that way in every aspect of life. And so understanding that that's where, you know, you, you've got to get this right, but if you if your breath is not working, then nothing else is going to work because right. as a player, it's not, not going to work as a as a performer or as, as a business person. It's not going to work because if your breath is locked in, that restricts your body, it restricts your thought processes. It, it just screws the whole pooch. So, uh, yeah, I think that that's super, super cool stuff and, and very useful. Um, I want to. Uh, jump off of the the education tip and uh, talk about your your project uh the the black gold orchestra the uh the black gold orchestra is born as uh, kind of the brainchild of a really good friend of mine named larry wilson he's an um, award-winning producer uh amazing drummer amazing band leader um actually great singer and organist too he's like one of those jacks of all trade um and funny enough i would had a similar vision but i didn't have I didn't have the time, nor I think the the push to really go forward with it. 
but he had the idea to form an all black um, um, jazz ensemble, like a big band. And, you know, they exist. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not going to this, this. The idea itself is not groundbreaking. But what he decided to do differently was to form an ensemble like today <laughs> in 2021. Yeah. That is just all it, it turned out to be all black men. That wasn't on purpose. It just happened that way. But once he put the ensemble together, he wanted to bring together people of a couple different musical backgrounds who also share a background in big band music. And like for the ensembles, I guess the repertoire to reflect that as well. What makes this particular band unique from a lot of other, um, you know, configurations like this is the combination of just, you know, straight ahead swing, combination of hip hop influences, and it's uh, of gospel. I think what, what tends to happen is I see bands full of jazz musicians who include these other styles and who has to work in, in house, like frequently in like a straight ahead quintet, you know, in a modern straight ahead quintet in a swing band and big band working on gospel projects and award shows. And when, as somebody who has to delve in all of those different areas, I find that you can tell when a person gets it honest. You can tell when it's coming from a, a sincere place of understanding for that particular music because it's, it, it all has a different swing, I think is the best way to put it. Yeah. So when I hear it's like certain gospel musicians, you know, trying to swing, I can tell that the swing portion is not the wheelhouse and vice versa. When I hear jazz musicians trying to play, you know, gospel music or church or spiritual, I'm like, I can tell, you know, you, you don't even you don't even own a Bible. You know, I can I can hear that kind of stuff. Right. The thing that makes this band really unique to me is that it's full of people who unique, I mean, who, who honestly have full-fledged backgrounds in every single style of music that's being covered. And it shows once the music is being played that there's an understanding that this particular music may need to be played a little straighter because this is where it comes from. And this is how we grew up playing it. Whereas right. this music needs to swing because that's the way, you know, we play this. You know, it's never like a, well, how do they play this music? Let me see if I can create that. I feel like this is one of those settings that's rarely comprised of a bunch of people that get it on, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what makes it unique because exploring these other styles, even when you're adding the gospel element to it, gospel is a tricky thing because if, if it's not already in you, then people at the church will recognize that yeah. in, a, in a heartbeat. Yeah. But here we got a group of musicians that are both of the church and of the world <laughs> yeah. and they're playing this music. I think um, he's put up some samples from, uh, from the last session that we did. And after the, after we played the first selection at this session, there was a, a, a really tangible energy in the room. And I'm normally not the kind of person to talk like this. I'm not, I'm not that deep. Mm -hmm. However, even I couldn't deny that it just felt different. Like mm -hmm. the second we finished that first cut, all we could do is look around the room, kind of smile at each other. And there was a, a limited audience, maybe 20 people in the room as well. And it was a shared reaction. Mm -hmm. Like we felt like applauding because it was just it's just one of those moments. It's nothing like. Um, and I, I know that I, I, I mentioned being black a lot, but there's something to it because being black in America normally is is not always the most favorable experience. Mm -hmm. But in that you know, in that unfavorable, we find ways to, to create something more favorable. And that's, that's what we've done historically. That's why we have jazz. And so when we were playing it then and recording it, it felt like reconnecting to the creators, you know. In fact, the, the ironic thing about that statement is the first tune we recorded was called The Creation, uh, Charles Erling, uh, Erling tune. And um, when, when we played it, we couldn't help but feel like, you know, the people that first wrote this music or the people that first played or first discovered, it just felt like they were in the room with us. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm, I'm, I, I promise I am not this deep. I'm not, you know, a person, I'm, I'm not burning sage on a regular basis, but that day that was a shared feeling between every single individual in the room enough to let me know that this particular ensemble is something special. Mm -hmm. And we are, are returning to the studio this weekend, in fact, to record more of the project. And there's an, you know, I, I I think he even put up a link, people that want to support it, because after he dropped the first video, they gave a glimpse into the project. 
you know, our social media accounts and emails and phone calls, it, it blew up. The reception was was unbelievable. And it was really unexpected. We thought we were just going to tell you guys, hey, we got something going on here. But the response was like, wow, this is beautiful. I've never seen anything like this. I really wanted to bring this here. Can we bring it here? We would love for the kids to see this. You know, so that, that lets me know that there's some really strong implications for what this particular band can do that kind of goes beyond just the music they're playing. Mm-hmm. Oh, that, that sounds really great. I, you know, the the clips that, that I, I saw and heard, you know, it, 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 it's something, like you said, something special. Yeah. And, and if you want to uh, support this, there's a link in the show notes. So uh, there's a GoFundMe page. So definitely go uh, go to that and uh, support it because, I mean, that's the thing is that, you know, as musicians, that's always been the hard part is that it's it's yeah, it, the days of having those uh what, what do they used to call them back in the old days um the the people that would support the artist um patrons or yeah, <laughs> yeah 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 so i, I guess <laughs> yeah we, we got patreon now yeah. Uh, but yeah but yeah you, you know, you'd have those those uh those patrons who would just uh you know hey i i want you to compose you know this and, and so i'm gonna i'm gonna give you whatever you need and so you don't have to worry about you know, having a day job, right. you know, you can just, right. you, right. You, the, the house, the family and, and like, yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. Because, you know, it's uh, it, those days are gone. Yeah. But, but uh, you know, it, it's yeah. nice to know that, uh, that people are not just um, trying to uh, stay connected to the roots of what they do. Uh, right. But, you know, it, it's a take it all, bring it together, bring it forward. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so it's not 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 staying stuck in the past. Right. But it's also not ignoring the past. It's accepting mm-hmm. that, you know, we're, we're kind of just like in this this nation, we're a melting pot or supposed yes. to be a melting pot. So yep. so, you know, I, I think that like with a if you have a, a, a recipe for for something like yeah, you know, I've heard people talk about you know, the United States being like gumbo, you know, cause yeah, because you get all that stuff in there. Right. But if it's a good gumbo, you're going to be able to taste and identify the mm-hmm. different ingredients in there, right? Because you know, if you can't if you can't identify this spice or can't identify this meat, it's not good. Mm-hmm. But if any of them are out of balance or they they're not right, then then it's not then it's also not good. So so it's right. you know, I think with having all those different stylistic variants, um, it's it's really unique when you can like you say, Jan, you can hear okay, well yeah that that is I mean that's gospel, you know right or that's right that's swing that's you know that's blues that's you know mm-hmm. whatever it is because there are those subtle nuances in terms of uh you know the the timing the inflection and things like that and yeah, i think yeah. like you said when you have people that are genuine in those expressions then uh you you get that that sense and and it's nice to be able to do that without having to go to 10 different shows you yeah. know when you can, when you can listen to one project yeah. just boom 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 yeah. you know? Yeah, that's the truth. That's the truth, man. Yeah. So that's and, you know, I think um, I think you hit on another interesting point too. Just dealing with um, like when we talk about all of these different styles, they all come from the same place when it's all said and done. And so I feel like the I feel like the the, the most studied musician benefits from growing up in the church when it comes to this music. Because mm-hmm. in the end, it's coming from the same place. It's only twelve notes, you know. If yeah. we're like bare brass about it. And the nuances, it comes from, but let's claim it as an accent, if nothing else. You know, yeah. if you're from, you know, it, you mentioned New, like Gumbo, if you're from New Orleans, there's an accent that makes it clear you're from New Orleans. Whereas if you're from New York, there's an accent that makes it clear you're from New York. Right. So when we talk about these different styles of music, if you're from the church, there's something in how you play, there's an accent in your music that makes it clear that this is your background. But if you're from there and you have that accent and then you start to explore other styles of music, it, it, it kind of it melts in and it becomes obvious this jazz musician grew up <laughs> in the church, you know, or it becomes obvious this jazz musician studied, you know, for years. But when you have the combination of those things, it creates a whole nother beast. Yeah. And I think um, that. I bring it up because that and this ensemble is made up. That's what I think his um, 
I kind of feel like that was missing from a lot of the other, you know, organizations that have gone this route. It's not, um, you know, how to put it, it's not limiting. I think that's the best way to put it. Mm -hmm. Don't feel like, okay, I got these guys with all of this, so, but I guess I can't put a chart in front of them. No, it's not that situation at all. You give them the hardest thing that you can find and they're going to make it work. And, And then you could tell them, hey, I just want to play a head chart and they'll make it work. I want to make up a song on the spot and they'll make it work. It's just one of those kinds of groups. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm like genuinely excited to see where this is. Well, I, go. I'm excited to see it as well. So uh, yeah, that, that just sounds, it sounds phenomenal. All right. Well, I know, oh, I, I know you, you've, uh, you have plenty on your plate. So we've got three segments we need to get through real quick before I can, I can uh, let you go. Um, but first we kind of, okay. we've kind of talked about some of the stuff before uh, and this is a, uh, this is our sound off segment. This is brought to us by uh, Michael Barkley of Barkley Microphones. Um, and uh, mm-hmm. this is all about uh, what your approach to developing sound uh, is, uh, particularly, how, you know, the understanding that, that like with a language, mm-hmm. uh, there's, a, there's a right sound for the job. So, yes. um, so what, what advice do you give people in terms of uh, the development of sound? Okay. So I I tell guys all the time that you want a basic trumpet tone when it's all said and done. A lot of times I reference the same reference that was given to me by Prof. And that was his teacher, uh, Adolf Herseth from the Chicago Symphony, um, to just this big, bold and bright, like you could hear every inch of his tone. But he was sitting in the back of the orchestra. And, you know, once you can hear how that carries over the orchestra to the back of the symphony hall, you know, just that idea, you can develop that sound and be able to carry that sound throughout the range of the instrument and throughout the different uh, like volume levels, then that's when you've really discovered it. One of the tips that I always give my students has to do again with the tongue. Um, Our prophet always say the tongue is neutral. It should remain neutral. The way I translate that is by telling them students that you want your tongue to kind of lay down and create a bed for the air to travel over. If you think about your mouth as, um, as, as existing as a circle, within that circle, your tongue re- generally resides somewhere bottom towards the middle of it. And what you do to try to control that is you arch your tongue or you lower your tongue. And all of that has to do with what you're saying if you want to control that. Like I'm, there are a bunch of brilliant people that can control that. What I'm about it, and that's that's amazing. I was not one of those people. I had to learn what I was saying to get around. So when we talk about dialect, I tell people you say ah, that drops your tongue to a certain position. You say ooh, you get a position. E, you get a position. And there are a bunch of other syllables. But by by using Prav's thing to keep your tongue neutral while you're doing those things, that is the trick. And that is when you learn how to control your tone throughout the different ranges. Because the mistake that most people make is in trying to play up high, they arch their tongue up too high. And once that tongue reaches the roof of your mouth, you tap out. There's nowhere else for the air to go. Your sound is gone. And if you're too close to the top with your E setting, then you have a thin tone up top. So what I teach people all the time is to learn how to work with a middle or more neutral setting and still say, ah, ooh, e. All of those different syllables, it's like six that, that generally are taught without extending this to the point that it changes your sound. And one, once they discover that, that, that generally gives them a really good sound. Again, that's if they're using enough wind to support that. Mm-hmm. But the idea is, to, is uh, to allow your tongue space to move more than anything else. And that generally seems to create a much more favorable tone on the instrument. All right. Yeah. That's gold, man. That's I'm gonna, I'm gonna, try, I'm gonna try that myself. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a game changer. All right, cool. All right, next segment is uh geared up. This is all about uh gear brought to us by our good friends at Venture Mouthpieces. And uh, you know, mm-hmm. this is not necessarily uh, you know, who who uh whose gear you're playing, although if you want to go down that road, that that's fine, but mostly <laughs> uh, about um, and we touched on this earlier, kind of like the approach to gear. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, because I think a lot of times, uh, that's one of the things that we're really, uh, at least I know when I was in school, I wasn't taught how to approach gear. 
You know, mm-hmm. just, you know, hey, this is the horn I play. You should play the same horn. Yep. Uh, yep. So uh, what, what's your approach to gear and, and uh, you know, what, what advice would you give people in terms of, of structuring their, their quest? All right. The, the, the best device we have in zeroing in on that type of thing is trial and error. Is trial and error. What happens is, like you said, a person has been told this horn is great. And I, you know, I, I don't mind mentioning that. I, I mean, I, I just recently got, I, I just recently signed an endorsement with Bach. And I hadn't played on Bach in years, mind you. I had a Bach um, that same professor put me on when I was studying with him. It was a great horn. And at the time, it, it from the horns that I played before, it took a little more work for me to be able to play that horn effectively and consistently. But I always loved the way the instrument itself sounds. So I was willing to always do the work. But if we're honest about it, you get older, some things change. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, I ended up playing on a couple of different horns over the years. I was on the Carbo for a lot of years. Those are some really easy horns to play. Like the, you know, you can do whatever on them and not even feel it. The response time is light and quick. And I love the instrument. I love the look of the instrument, doing a lot of TV work. Um, what I found though, is that what I missed because the material, uh, was made out of carbon fiber, Mm -hmm. there's, um, the, the feedback level is different because the, you know, you, you get your feedback from the bell from this side of the horn based upon the materials and how they vibrate and watching the sound on print and microphone. And by the time it was recorded, I just wasn't getting it back in person. So, um, you know, Bach has done a lot of things to redevelop their instruments now that just just honestly are, are insane. And the way they play now is, you know, is, I think it's a lot different than the way my old horn played. And that horn was great. Mm-hmm. The thing that I tell people is you want to get on a horn and see how it adjusts to what you're already doing. And, you know, like the horns, they I think they I think they go with your different modes of life. Like if you play hard then you want a horn that can deal with that. Yeah. If you have a lighter tone, if you, you know, if there's something restricting your air, you want a horn that can deal with that. Mm-hmm. Not every instrument is made the same, even under the same brand name. And so um, what I found now is I'm getting older. So there's, there's a, there are certain things that I can feel are different, but the, for me, I also, um, I also was very sick like a year ago. And my lungs have not been the same since. And because of that, I've had to kind of adjust even my own breathing techniques, you know, to be able to still get the same results on the instrument. So that took some trial and error for me to find a horn that, again, adjusts to that, to where I feel like I'm still doing the things that I think I can do. Mm -hmm. So I, I would tell people all the time, the best thing you can do is to try the instrument first. There's no, I don't think there's a single horn you can assume from the jump is going to work for you and be completely right the second you get to that horn. And so I, there are all these, and it wasn't until recently that I discovered the little minute changes you can make to the instrument you already have to make them play differently. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'll tell people once again, you've got to try it. That's the only way. Mouthpieces included, you know, I, I can't look at the person and say, hey, hey, you might need a bigger mouthpiece because not everyone's on sure works that way. I can listen to him play and say, hey, you might want to try something different and see if, if, if it's more comfortable. But I, I would tell people, best thing you can do, go for comfort first. And mm-hmm. that will out, that will help you get more longevity on the instrument. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. Well, here's our final segment. Our final segment is uh, brought to us by our friends at Robinson's Remedies. This is Robinson's Remedies. We're rapid fire rounds a series of questions that bounce all over the place. Uh, and, uh, just want your quickest response to these. If you are ready, my friend. Go for it. All right, here we go. So Melvin Jones, first question for you. Who's the biggest influence on your life that is not a trumpet player? Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was an easy one. Uh, what's your favorite book? Uh, the power of positive thinking by Norman Van Peel. Uh, very good one. Uh, what's the worst movie you've ever seen? <laughs> Uh, snakes on a plane. Oh, <laughs> you, you, you gonna do that to Sam? <laughs> I'm sorry. He's, he's in love with some Morehouse. He's got to know. That's got to be one worth. And I'll All watch right. it over and over again. Uh, uh, yeah, it was a bad movie. Um, <laughs> if you weren't a trumpet player, what would you want to be? That's a great question. 
in, in my previous life, I wanted to be a comic book artist. Ooh. And and I used to actually draw. I, I had a you know career offer, um, and I I just let it go. And and I haven't drawn in years. And my daughter has now picked up. She seems to be pretty good at it. But that would that would have been my other choice. Ah, okay. Well, maybe it's time to do a a, a trumpet based comic book. So. <laughs> yep. All right. All right. Um, what's your favorite drink? Um, Uncle Nears with ginger beer all right um you could uh have a dinner party and invite any three living people in the entire world to this party who would they be all right, it's gonna be weird but i want to see wenton marcellus dave Chappelle, and mike tyson at the same t- table oh I man i think that would be some of the most interesting <laughs> It, it, it would be interesting <laughs> that, that that's for sure um the same dinner party you have three additional chairs but you uh, have to invite three people from history three people that, that are no longer with us all right that one's tougher um you know i, I might have a theme of between like boxers comedians and trumpet players still but <laughs> you know I, I would also love to include louis armstrong mm-hmm. muhammad ali and yeah, that last one's gonna be difficult. I can't think of another. I can't think of another person. Well, I mean, if, if we were going to go for it, I would love to know what JFK thinks about things as they are now. So I would probably invite him to the table too. That that would be that'd be a very interesting conversation. Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, lacquer plated or raw? Raw. All right. What's your favorite quote? Um, it's more than one way to skin a cat. Cat. <laughs> Don't say that to my cat. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what is your greatest fear? Uh, greatest fear would probably be if my kids <laughs> would probably be if my kids grew up and never knew the types of things that their parents did. Mm. Okay. You know? Yeah. I, I, I feel you on that one. Uh, you could be granted one superpower. Yeah. Flying. Instantly. Flying. All right. <laughs> yeah. That, that was, that That's was no flying. No thoughts on that one. Uh, yeah, I think that for most gigging musicians, that's one of the ones they would like to have. Yeah, if I could skip the airport and get there, that'd, that'd be a win. Exactly. Um, <laughs> what aspect of trumpet playing do you feel is the most overrated? I note. Okay. Yeah, and I, I, I think it's, I think range. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, what aspect do you think is the most underrated? Sound. Okay. Um, you can go back in time and give your younger self one piece of advice about music. What would it be? To take the things you're learning in school more seriously. <laughs> right. know, a lot of a lot of skills I put off ended up becoming part of my career. Mm-hmm. All right. And uh, while you're back there, you're going to give your younger self one piece of advice about life. Mm. Um, hesitate less. You know, never know what's going to happen until it's too late. <laughs> yeah. All right. And final question for Melvin Jones. What do you want your legacy to be? Um, I would like to see the people that I give to return the favor and to see them give to the next person, almost like a pay it forward type life. You know, I, I love seeing my kids, our students, I call them the kids, but I love seeing my students become teachers. I love to see them instruct people. I love to, to trade theories. You know, that's if, if there were any legacy as an, an educator, I think it would be to see others go into education or to at least share the things that they know. That's that's great. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you 100 percent on that. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it it's creating that that foundation for the next generation and uh, hopefully one that, that just continues to grow as time goes on. Mm-hmm. So um, 
Melba, I want to thank you so much for uh, taking the time to, to be with me. This was uh, a great hang, uh, getting to know yes, you. Sir. Uh, you are you are definitely a, um, a, a very deep man. You, even though <laughs> you, say, you say you're not that deep, you're very deep. Uh, and uh, I am looking forward to, uh, you know, getting to know you even better over time and, and, and keeping track on what's going on with, uh, with all of your projects. And uh, as I said before, if you sure. want to support Black and Gold, uh, the, the GoFundMe uh, link is in the show notes. Make sure you do that uh, mm-hmm. and, and keep, keep up with everything that's going on. So um, mm-hmm. thank you so much, my friend. And um, let's, uh, let's just keep, keep music alive. Yes, sir. All right. So, and thank you very much for joining us for this episode of the Trumpet Gurus Hang podcast. And uh, make sure you uh, subscribe, share, and do all those wonderful things uh, that can keep this uh, wonderful event going so I can just hang out with really cool people for, you know, more time. So, (laughs) as always, guys, in slide grease, we out. Thanks for hanging with us today. This podcast is all about creating deeper connections through our mutual love of music and the trumpet life. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast and also like and share this episode with a friend. We want to see the hang grow for show. Please support our sponsors and consider becoming a personal supporter of this podcast as well. Remember, for less than the price of a bottle of valve oil a month, you can keep this podcast moving smoothly. The Trumpet Guru's Hang is recorded at the Candy Factory, a co-working space and social club located in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Jose Johnson is the executive producer. Post-production editing is by Mitch Bowers. Our opening theme song was composed and performed by Lexi Signal, and our closing theme music comes courtesy of The Greatest Funeral Ever. Incidental music is by Ethan Swayze and Jose Johnson. Graphic design by Ann Kirby of The Sweet Corps. The Trumpet Guru's Hang podcast is produced in collaboration with the So Good Lancaster Media Group.